uh, on, on a major attack. Oliver Otis Howard again, commanding the 11th Corps, was, was over in the vicinity of the West Woods, uh, on the western side of, of the town as well. Came under heavy, heavy pressure, and of course he had to retreat back to Cemetery Ridge behind the town of uh, Gettysburg. Uh, I don't subscribe to the shoe story. There were only 2,300 residents in, in, in Gettysburg. There were no shoe manufacturing uh, homes that I know of. So if, if they wanted shoes, uh, they weren't going to get too many if they stripped them from the feet of the 2,300 citizens, I don't uh, think. But one main regiment played a significant role that afternoon, and that was the 16th Maine Infantry Regiment. They were one of the last to leave the field. And again, Hall's 2nd Maine Battery. They were one of the last because their, their assignment was to keep firing on those troops and retreat, fire, retreat, to give the retreating Union troops ample opportunity to retreat. The 16th Maine, composed of 260, suffered 80% cash. 80%. I can't remember, something like 160 taken prisoner of war. So you can see the, the heavy cat. That ended the first day's battle. The second day's battle, Longstreet confers with Lee, going to try to flank the very left of the Union line, now stretched out across Cemetery Ridge, slide in, roll them up, and gain the victory. And what was found early on in the day of July 2nd that there's no Union troops defending the left of the Union lines. And finally, uh, one, one brigade under the command of Colonel Strong Vinson was the brigade that occupied those lines. And that brigade consisted of the 20th Maine, New York Regiment, 83rd Pennsylvania, and the 16th Mission. Uh, Michigan. And of course, which regiment was at the very left of the lines? The 20th Maine Infantry, which was attacked uh, by Colonel Oates with his uh, Alabama Regiment. And I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of detail, but we just held five attacks, and we were out of ammunition uh, after the fifth charge, and I saw Oates assembling for yet another one, and I felt the only course of action was to give the order to fix bayonets and make a bayonet charge. And that worked. I think that caught Oates quite by surprise, and he ordered a retreat of his men. And that ended the second day's battle. And the third day's battle, Lee decides an all out frontal assault on the very center of the Union lines on Cemetery Ridge with 15,000 troops. Longstreet disagreed. He said, General Lee, no 15,000 troops are going to be able to take those lines. But Lee was, at this point, it was all or nothing. General George Pickett was the commanding general. Artillery fired to soften up the Union lines before those Confederates were uh, given the order to start their charge across the three-quarter three quarter mile open field. It was close to two o'clock. Guess what the commander of the Union artillery decided to do? We will fool, we will fool the Confederates. Rather than ordering the Union artillery to all out fire and return, they fired sporadically, leading the Confederates to think that their artillery had destroyed most of the Union artillery. So that march across that field, they weren't going to be under heavy artillery fire. And you can imagine when they got to within 
oh, let's say 100 yards of the Union line when the Union artillery opened fire full. Oh. There's different kinds of shot you really, there's a solid shot, which is just a solid cannonball. Those are fired to skip like a bowling ball and knock you over, kill you and knock you over. Like a bowling ball knocks over the bowl of the pins. Then there's the exploding shot. There's a fuse in it with powder and you time it so it explodes over the troops and all the shrapnel canister shot, which is like a giant shotgun shell with thousands of little round balls. And you wait till the enemy gets about 50 yards away before you fire. And this would have what it would have been like if you had been there. If you were one of those Union troops, you would have seen that long line of Confederates marching the cannonballs would fire and strike, and you would see as though 100 feet of the line disappeared, vanished into thin air, blown to pieces. You would see arms flying through the air, sir, really. You would see heads flying through the air. That's, I'm being very graphic, but that's the way. It was. General Lewis Armistead was leading uh, one of the groups. He made it to the stone wall, by the way. He leaped over the wall, put his hands on a Union cannon, and said, This gun is mine. <laughs> Isn't that a, yeah. He was struck right here by a Union soldier, heavily wounded. Guess who he called for? He called for a, one of the Union generals who had been his friend in the early army. He asked for General Hancock. Hancock had been wounded himself. Oh, by the way, Hancock, he was on his horse, and, and the Confederate uh, shot hit his saddle and drove a saddle nail into it. <laughs> he said, boy, the Confederates must be in desperate need of, of, of bullets. They're now firing saddle nails. <laughs> so someone did tend to uh, Armistead, and he did die of, uh, of his wounds. But here again, sometimes we have to be careful what we might say. Words can become very prophetic. When he decided to go with the Confederacy, they were stationed in San Francisco. He and Hancock, and Hancock had a farewell party for him that evening. And just before Armistead said goodbye, he hugged Hancock and said, if I take up arms against you, may God strike me dead. Yeah. Yeah. Those were, were somewhat prophetic. Of course, the, the, the frontal assault was a failure. We retreated back to uh, Virginia. That's the last time Southern troops would uh, march onto Northern soil. That was my time. <laughs> now, the president. He's still looking for a fighting general who understands the art of war. Oh, I don't want to leave out the Western armies, but time, time, I, I don't have the time, but uh, Grant was commanding troops, played an important role. Here was the plan. The Western army separate the Southern Confederate states from the, from the upper Confederate states because it was those upper Confederate states who find providing a lot of food supplies and other supplies. So that was the plan, if we separate them and take control of the Mississippi River. And that was the plan. Uh, easier said than done, because there were those battles uh, in the West uh, as well. But uh, come uh, January of 64, uh, the President ordered Grant to meet with him and decides to appoint him the commanding general of all the Union armies. Now, the story that goes with it is a friend of the president's 
when he learned that this is what Lincoln was planning to do, he met with him and he said, uh, Mr. President, I understand you're going to appoint Grant, a, a lieutenant general, three stars, put him in command. The president said, that's right. He said, do you not know he drinks too much, Mr. President? And Lincoln replied, can you find out what that, uh, what kind of whiskey he drinks? Because <laughs> I'm going to order a few barrels of it and send it to some of these other generals. <laughs> what it takes to fight to uh, yeah. hear. So at any rate, he does. He returns back, meets with Sherman, says, you're now in control over here. I'm going to link up with the Army of the Potomac. We're going to put an end, we're going to destroy the Confederate armies. I'm going to march and we will destroy Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Kind of like the Convince the movement. Germans going to go down through Georgia, the Carolinas. The Army of the Potomac is going to go likewise east, and it just ended. Easier said than done. Easier said than done. May second, uh, third, and fourth. Army of the Potomac would meet Lee's army near Chancellorsville in a place called the Wilderness. Heavy, heavy casualties. But Lee's under pressure to retreat. Lee then retreated down to Spotsylvania Courthouse. He had earthworks 32 miles long, kind of in the shape of a horseshoe. And he's behind the horseshoe. May 12th, I think it was, orders attack the Confederate troops in that horseshoe. By day's end, 12,000 casualties. Uh, but Lee's under pressure to retreat. He retreats to Petersburg. There's another attempt for six months, seven months, eight months. Can't break through those lines. Uh, in fact, June 2nd, June 2nd of 1864, Lee had positions on a hill not too distant from Richmond, and Union troops were ordered to attack and suffered 7,000 casualties in 28 minutes. In 28 minutes. Between May 2nd at the Battle of the Wilderness and June 2nd, our army suffered 30,000 casualties that month. And then in the next eight months, trying to break through Lee's lines at Petersburg, we suffered another 60,000. Finally, the breakthrough came in April. Lee and his army were retreating to Appomattox where there was a train waiting for rations. But General Bill Sheridan, commanding the cavalry, got there for us, cut Lee off. And so finally Lee met Grant's request to surrender. And that surrender took place April 9th, Palm Sunday. Isn't that kind of appropriate? Palm Sunday. Oh, by the way, a man by the name of Wilma McLean uh, during the Battle of Bull Run, his house was right there in the middle of the battlefield. He got tired of the war being fought in his dooryard. He decided to move further south to get away from it. That's where the surrender ceremony took place. <laughs> in his front parlor. <laughs> That's his claim to fame now. Yeah. Yeah. Terms of surrender. Media parole. Once his troops signed that they would not take up arms against the federal government. They would be free to go home. Number two, they could take their horses and mules home with them. You can imagine the South was devastated, strict of food, supplies. They were going to need to get all the spring planning in. And third, the officers could keep their side on a gesture of trust. Uh, leads up to the terms. Oh, 